Hi, my name is Christopher, and I'm here today to do the short course uh, of the E3S Center on the nanophotonics and optical interconnects, along with Michael Eggleston. So I'll start out with uh, doing a presentation of uh, optical, an overview of optical interconnects in general, where we are today and uh, the vision for the future. Then uh, Michael Eggleston will go into technical details about the emitters uh, in this part of the presentation. And uh, then I'll be back uh, to talk about nanophotodetectors and uh, phototransistors uh, towards the end. So what's uh, the problem with wires? Why do we want to switch to uh, optical interconnects? Now, uh, if you look at a wire like this one, uh, its bandwidth is going to be limited by the RC product of uh, the wire. Now, uh, the resistance of the wire scales um, like L over A. So the, the ratio of the length over the area, the cross section here, and length here. Whereas the capacitance is going to scale roughly uh, with L. So when you do the product of those, the RC product is going to scale as L squared over A. So what happens is, uh, uh, as we do with scaling for all the um, the other components in microelectronics. Uh, the problem with wires is when you scale from a wire like this one to a wire like this one, well, it turns out that the RC product doesn't change because you varied the length and uh, the cross section, all the dimensions in the same way. And um, what happens is that this uh, wire, uh, this smaller wire, cannot carry any more information than the bigger wire. So you, your bandwidth uh, product is going to li be limited. Uh, so this is illustrated uh, down here where you have copper uh, interconnects here. And you can see that the, uh, in order to get enough bandwidth into uh, uh, the back of a rack in a server room, you need a, a huge amount of copper interconnects. In comparison with um, optical interconnects that you can see in this picture, where it's obviously much cleaner because um, you don't have this problem with uh, fiber optics. Another uh, issue with um, wire interconnects uh, is that um, your energy uh, for every bit of information you want to communicate is going to be proportional to CV squared. And as your wire gets longer, your capacitance uh, is longer, uh, is bigger, and uh, so you're going to be dissipating a lot of energy uh, in those wires. Uh, you don't have that problem with optical interconnects. The longer you make your optical fiber, uh, mostly you, uh, you don't um, consume any extra power. That's the reason why today, for very long haul interconnects, um, everything's been switched to uh, optical fibers. And this is a map of the optical fiber um, capacity, submarine capacity. So these are optical fibers uh, under, underwater. And uh, today, between the United States and Europe, or between uh, uh, any continent, all the communication goes through fiber optics. And um, we've, come, we've uh, invented a lot of very neat tricks to amplify the signal along the way here. So uh, you, you get in a signal, and your, your fibers here are, are doped with erbium that's going to amplify the light. So you're able to communicate over thousands of kilometers without any problem. And today, we don't have any copper wires underneath the ocean anymore. It's all been replaced by uh, fiber optics. And um, to get even more bandwidth out of these systems, we're doing um, phase shift keying for uh, uh, data communication so that we can really get uh, as much information, as much uh, bandwidth as, as we can out of these optical links. So what's the state of the art uh, of systems today for optical interconnects? Well, um, we're obviously uh, on sh much shorter distances than uh, the um, underwater cables. And today, we have optical interconnects in server rooms. And this is an example of uh, Lextera's um, latest um, transceiver that you can see here. So it's obviously not the length, uh, the same length as uh, transoceanic um, links. And what you have is that you have a, an optical um, 
input here, and uh, on a on just one single silicon chip, you have got uh, that's uh, this is the silicon chip. You're going to have uh, the receiver circuitry, which is going to uh, convert the photons into electricity and uh, do all the data processing to get the information out, as well as all the transistor, um, the laser drivers, which are going to um, uh, drive here a laser module uh, to inject um, the information into the optical fiber. And so what we've got here is a silicon photonics chip uh, because we've mixed both um, CMOS transistors for um, the um, data processing and uh, um, optical waveguides, which I'll go over later, uh, on one single uh, silicon chip. So it's silicon photonics. And the energy efficiency of uh, these systems today is about 18 picojoules per bit for the entire system. So that means that for every bit of information, the energy that is uh, used by the laser and by the silicon um, transistors uh, to interpret the information and uh, drive the laser uh, amounts to 18 picojoules. So that's transmitter and receiver. These links are for rack-to-rack um, -rack, uh, um, server rooms, mostly. What's the vision in the future is that we're going to be able to go to even short, uh, bring optical links to even shorter distances. For example, this is the IBM uh, Terabus project, where uh, the optical link happens between uh, two chips, and you can see a, a scattered light here where the information is being propagated. And uh, so the energy requirement for these kind of communications is ob obviously much lower. We need to use uh, much lower energy per bit uh, with an objective of about 100 femtojoules for chip-to-chip -chip communications. Um, what, what you see in uh, this uh, photo um, is um, the, so the Terabus um, project has, a C, has achieved 9 picojoules per bit, and the record uh, by IBM is actually um, 1.4 picojoules per bit. So we're still, for chip-to-chip -chip, uh, communications, we're still far from the objective, uh, which is um, needed for this technology to make sense uh, to replace copper wires. And finally, the ultimate vision for um, optical interconnects is to do on-chip um, interconnects. And this time, we're going to be aiming for an objective of about 30 femtojoules per bit uh, in, order for this for, in order for it to be worth uh, replacing uh, copper wires. So why is it so important uh, to replace uh, on-chip communications uh, from copper wires to optical interconnects? Well, it's, a, it's about energy consumption and actually the, the chip uh, heating. Now, if we look at the uh, ITRS specs for 2011, the um, chip power consumption budget is 161 watts, and 78% of all that energy goes into charging and discharging the interconnects on the chip. If we go ahead and look at the 2020 ITRS, uh, we've got a chip power consumption of 130 watts. And if we actually go through the math of looking at the um, number of metal layers and the capacitances of all the wires, the clock speed, and the uh, voltages, well, it turns out that we have to use more than 130 watts just to run the interconnects. So we're going to uh, run into a, a problem here, and uh, it's, it's already an issue today. We have chips like uh, there is under here that are completely overheating and um, that require uh, active cooling. You can see here some uh, uh, cooling um, fluent tubes uh, in just for the chip to be able to run. So that's something unacceptable. We don't want any of this uh, in, our, in our computers. It's also starting to become um, an issue or just in terms of uh, energy, energy uh, efficiency um, worldwide. And uh, 
we're expecting uh, the energy consumption of IT to be about 1% of the world total's energy consumption. So um, we have to start uh, taking this problem seriously, and that's uh, the ultimate goal of uh, the E3S Center, have uh, energy efficient electronics systems. So let's have a little, uh, a quick look at the uh, system. What does an optical link um, take? Well, you need uh, a source, which is here. So this is a laser diode and its driver. So then you get light emitted from the laser diode, uh, which you're going to uh, a channel to your receiver. So it's, uh, in this case, it's uh, through a waveguide. But you could imagine other systems. Uh, and then you've got, at the end of the waveguide, um, a photodiode that's here, which is going to absorb the light, produce a photovoltage, uh, some photocharge. And that's, you're going to need to amplify that signal uh, in order for, to be able to use it. And so you're going to have uh, an amplification system here. And of course, there's a capacitance associated with your photodiode which uh, you're going to have to charge uh, up and down. So we're interested in the energy consumption of this entire system. Now, um, I'll be very simple for the energy consumption of the driver and the laser. Basically, we're going to send a certain amount of charge per bit, a certain amount of photons. So this is the photon charge. And for every photon, we're going to require a certain voltage uh, in order to generate which is represented here. So this uh, factor, V transmitter, includes um, the energy of the photon itself and all the inefficiencies of the driving system. So uh, to summarize, the more photons you send into your waveguide, the more energy you're going to use on the transmitter side. Now on the receiver side, well, we want to take uh, into account the energy of this entire receiving system. So mostly, it's going to be the energy consumed by uh, the first stage of the amplification right here. And so the energy per bit is going to be, um, this is obvious, the power times the uh, bit uh, time. And in this system, it's mostly going to be, the power is mostly going to be the product of the uh, uh, driving voltage times uh, the current that is going to be um, driven through the transistor here. And we'll go over this derivation later, but here's the final product. And what we can see is that the energy consumed by the receiver is proportional to the capacitance of the photodiode and inversely proportional, proportional to uh, the photon charge. So basically, in this case, the more photons you receive at your photodiode, the less energy you consume because you've already got uh, a significant signal and you don't need to amplify it as much. So we see that we've got uh, conflicting uh, interests here. In order to um, optimize the driver, we would rather use less photons, but in order to optimize the emitter energy, we want to use more photons. So there's a balance. And it's summarized uh, in this, uh, on this plot here. So on the x-axis, we've got the number of photons per bit we're going to use. So that's uh, Q photonic um, from the previous slide. And on the y-axis, we've got the resultant energy per bit. Um, of the system. So what we've got in high number of photons per bit is that we're going to be the cost and the energy per bit of the link is going to be dominated by the photon energy, which is represented here. So as you can see, all these uh, curves um, come and lie against the photon energy. And then uh, we've got four different um, lines here, and they all correspond to different capacitances associated with the photodiode. So in the first, on the orange line, you've got a photodiode that's 10 femtofarads, the red 1 femtofarads, 100 attofarads for the green, and finally 10 attofarads for the blue. 
And what you can see is that the lower the capacitance of your photodiode, the lower the energy uh, your amplifier consumes. So you're going to have optimums uh, every time. Uh, and basically, you're going to want to use the, for a given photodetector capacitance, so say we have a photodetector of one femtofarad, we're going to be wanting to use approximately 3,000 photons per bit for an optimal system energy. Now, where does the IBM record I was talking about earlier lie? Way up here. So um, they're using um, about 6,000, uh, 60,000, sorry, photons per bit, and their efficiency is 1.4 picojoules per bit. So normally, with that amount of photons, they should be able to lie around tenths of femtojoules. So something's wrong, and we'll go over uh, what's going on afterwards. Now, what's the limit in terms of photons per bit we can use? Um, well, there's something called the quantum limit, and that's 17 photon per bit. But what exactly is the quantum limit? Well, when photons are emitted from a coherent source, such as a laser, they follow a Poisson statistic uh, distribution, meaning that if um, the average number uh, that comes out per unit time, um, the average number of photons that comes out from that laser per unit time is ns, then the probability uh, in that amount of time of actually seeing n uh, is a Poisson distribution. And here's the formula. So what does that mean exactly? Well, say your laser uh, per um, picosecond uh, usually emits about one photon. So that's not a very powerful laser. <laughs> um, well, the probability that you'll see actually one photon in that amount of time is only about 0.35. There's also a probability that, that a probability that you'll see zero, there's a probability that you'll see two, and there's a probability that you'll see three, and so on. And that probability is dict dictated by this formula. Now, if the probability um, was, uh, if the mean amount of photons coming out of that laser per unit time was 10, uh, you'd be on this blue uh, distribution here. And actually, as NS uh, becomes uh, very big, you approach a Ga Gaussian distribution. Now, if we want a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 15, meaning, well, there will be a mistake every uh, 10 to the 15 uh, bits of information communicated. And we consider that we have a bit duty factor of 50%. That means that there's an equal amount of zeros and, in one, and of ones. Uh, well, this results in a 17 photon per bit quantum limit. What does that mean? That means that if you're on average uh, sending 17 photons per bit, well, you have a 10 to the minus uh, 15 chance of seeing zero. And so 1 minus 10 to the 15 of seeing at least one photon. And that's how we come to this um, um, 17 photon per bit quantum limit. And it's, um, it's summarized right here. 34 photons for a 1, so that's only 17 photons on average. Um, well, the Poisson distribution uh, of seeing zero photons uh, the Poisson probability of seeing zero photons is 10 to the minus 15. So that's how we get to the quantum limit. And now Michael Eggleston will move on uh, to talk about emitters, uh, lasers versus LEDs.